Hello, Comics Alternative fans. Before we start with the episode, we want to invite all of you to check out our Patreon campaign. That's right. Go to www.patreon.com slash comics alternative for more details. There you'll find more information about the campaign and the cool rewards levels we have. For as little as $1 a month, you can help us maintain good quality comics talk. And the more you contribute, the more perks you get. These include monthly podcast episodes exclusive to Patreon supporters, as well as the chance to help us choose which books we review on the show. So be sure to visit www.patreon.com slash comics alternative and become one of our proud podcast patrons. Yeah, and now on with the show. This is the Comics Alternative Interviews. A conversation with Joe Keating and Nick Barber. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode we have the pleasure of talking with Joe Keating and Nick Barber. They're the creators behind the new series Ringside. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you'll find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some wonderful specials. And November is no different. Sometimes those specials are at 45% off cover price, sometimes at 50% off. But often, the discounts become more impressive than that. That's right. And this month, as in every month, they have a load of bundles to take advantage of where you can get a deeper discount on multiple comics from the same publisher than you would get if you bought those comics individually. And so this month they have 50% off bundles from Marvel, DC, Valiant, and also DC Vertigo, which uh, is continuing their deep discounts on those new Vertigo titles that they've been running for the last few months. Yeah, I'm glad they're continuing that. Uh, But you can count on those as well as other discounts every single month at DCB Service. You have to go to the website to see what they are, because there are a lot. That's Mm -hmm. dcbservice.com. Go there now for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Andy, this is a fun conversation we had with Joe and Nick. Now, The first issue of Ringside will be coming out in a couple of days after this episode goes up, and that's on the 25th of November. So uh, we really like uh, this first issue. We had a great conversation, and we're hoping that the fun that we had will Mm -hmm. resonate with our listeners, and then they'll go out and anticipate getting issue number one of Ringside as well. Yes. So let's go ahead and give that uh, conversation a listen to. Yep, let's do it. We're here today with the creators of the new image series Ringside. We've got the writer Joe Keating and the artist Nick Barber. Thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah, Thanks sure. Joining us. Yeah, welcome to the podcast. And so, just kind of get started, I guess. Let's uh, tell the listeners what uh, what Ringside is about and what they can expect from this this series. Sure. Uh, I guess I'll do this one. Uh, <laughs> Ringside's an ongoing ensemble drama set in a world of uh, professional wrestling, um, but it's very much not about what happens in the ring. It's actually like more about like how 
like art and industry kind of a conflict with each other and how the business affects people's lives and that kind of thing. So like the lead character of the first arc and, you know, the, who the lead characters will switch up as it goes on. Um, uh, they'll, he's not even in the industry really anymore. He just retired from uh, training and now he's got to take care of a problem from his past. So there's a little bit of a crime angle to it. Um, but then also as it goes on, we expand our, our scope out of to, you know, all different sides of the wrestling sort of industry. But, you know, if you don't like wrestling at all, he's totally fine. It's not a really, it's not required. You think, uh, a lot of people who have read it, like, are not necessarily into wrestling. They, they seem to dig it. So reviews have been pretty good so far, I gotta say. So good job, Nick. Appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. that's, I don't know, that's ringside, right? Am I leaving anything out, Nick? No, that's a, that was a fairly succinct, uh, nice. description. Very good. Nice. So the the first issue pretty much focuses on uh, Danny Nosos, the yeah. the former wrestler known as the Minotaur, right? Uh, and and his return uh, and kind of a what is it, the kind of noir uh, convention of the you know the the exile returning home to take care of a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and so is is this first arc also going to then? introduce as uh secondary characters some of the ones who will be then picked up as the central focus for later arcs well uh yeah uh gosh what can you even say about this stuff at this point i mean even the first issue already has some like you know someone pointed out that we introduced about like six characters all together and yeah. you know, uh sometimes they'll be completely gone sometimes they'll be the main focus it'll kind of switch around and you know, as the series goes on, like I said, the scope changes and who we focus on changes. So, you know, um, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, especially on first issues, it's kind of difficult to talk about, like, what's coming up. <laughs> I, thought, I was, I was, I was, I was, I had, I had a bunch of work stuff last week and I had a meeting with this guy and I was talking about how much I wish we could just, and I know this is like totally unrealistic because I also like, you know, I, I work uh, with the store and their orders and everything. And I know it's unrealistic to expect, like, just put something out and don't say anything about it, but I kind of wish we could do that. Like from an unrealistic point of view, you know what I mean? Like I like the idea of like, oh, ringside wrestling, I like that, and then like that's it, you know, it's out, you gotta read it. But you know, obviously, there's so much in the market now, it's kind of unrealistic, and I'm just rambling on about how I think comics should be talked about. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, I don't want to get into too much detail about uh, who's who and what's what in the future. But yeah, for the first issue and the first uh, few issues, it does focus on uh, Daniel Nosis, who's a retired wrestler getting sucked into the life he had left through wrestling. So anyway, with, was, an, with was, a really interesting twist at the very end. Oh yeah. Thanks. I, uh, so far the one sort of negative review we got was like, Oh, it's an action book. And I'm like, that guy is going to be <laughs> sorely disappointed <laughs> 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 because it is, it is not, but whatever. I'd rather people find that out for themselves when they read the book. Well, he, he, he thought it was an action book or it wasn't. He thought it was. It's totally not. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It seems to be common with comic book reviews. People assume what the next issue may entail and then right. review the current issue accordingly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is very bizarre. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, let, let's uh, let's get to the, the very subject matter that you're dealing with, and that's wrestling. Now, do uh, both of you or either of you have a particular fondness or history with, uh, with uh, wrestling or... Um, how did you come across this this concept of we're going to base the story in the world of wrestling? Well, I've been into wrestling and continue to be uh, pretty much my whole life. Um, like Nick and I started off with it during a similar period of time, like the WWE superstars, 80s era, you know, people like Hogan and Jake the Snake and Andre the Giant and all those guys, you know. Uh, and then I kind of fell out of it a little bit and then I got back into it through the Attitude Era, uh, specifically McFoley. And then I kind of like, I don't know, I've always, like, and, like, through him, I discovered, like, ECW and the NDC and the Jap- and Japan and, like, everything else. Because, um, as I recall, he was like, kind of the first guy to be talking about wrestling, at least that I read, that was, like, beyond. It wasn't, like, gossip sheets. It wasn't, like, kayfabe. It was all, like, this is just how it is. And, it, and you know, it's hard and blah, 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 blah. So, and then, like, you know, of course, then Beyond the Mat came out and more recently uh, Resurrection of Jake the Snake. And I, I don't know. So, anyway... And then I got back into it again when they merged into CM Punk. And then uh, after he left, I kind of fell out of it a little bit again. I kind of like attached myself to certain guys. 
Um, and then I got really back into it due to Kevin Owens. But even throughout that whole time, without being like, whenever my interest with Wayne in WWE would be replaced or addition to something else like uh, Ring of Honor or uh, I don't know, man. I'm kind of all over the map. Uh, and but the idea for Ringside came in, in 2009, 2010, when I was like, I don't know. I just always wanted to do a wrestling comic that, like, I love. I mean, there's a lot of great wrestling comics um, out there, and uh, like there have been for for decades, you know. But I'd never seen one that was like, I want to read that one. And so that's how it came. But, you know, the further it went along, I mean, it is obviously a wrestling comic, but uh, it's also not in a way. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how to – people just kind of read it for themselves. You know, it's not like – I think even sometimes if someone was giving me shit this last week, they're like, oh, you pushed the wrestling angle too much, which I don't agree with. But, you know, I, I think people may have the wrong impression of it to some degree. You know, I think people are, are like, oh, it's going to be all these crazy – characters duking it out in the ring and i'm like nope <laughs> not at all yeah well you know that's interesting that 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 the, the person you, you mentioned reacted that um you know they they thought that there was maybe too much wrestling in there i really yeah i know I, I don't have much knowledge when it comes to the world of wrestling uh you know when i was a kid i used to watch it like in the 1970s so nature boy rick flair yeah i recognize nice. that name other than that though i'm completely clueless so when we saw this solicit uh, a few months ago, I remember Andy and I commenting on it, and I just assumed that from the very first issue, this would be deeply enmeshed in the world of wrestling. And I was really surprised that, well, yeah, it takes place in the world of wrestling, but at least in this first issue, it's not really about wrestling. In fact, there's really not much wrestling at all that goes on in here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the worst. I mean, it, it, the action itself, the fight, takes place outside of the ring. Yep, and that's why, uh, yeah, I mean, like, the tagline for the book was, the real violence is outside the ring, or whatever, you know. But, I mean, yeah, it's like, uh, like, you know, it's like, it's more of the setting for it. You know, it's like even less than, you know, the film The Wrestler, or, uh, I don't know, one of my big inspirations, from just in general, was a movie called uh, Night in the City, and if you guys ever saw that. Nick, have I, have I had you watch that yet? Oh, that I've seen the, that, the, yeah. Is yeah, that yeah, the yeah. De Niro version? No, 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 no. Well, the, I mean, er, the, the, the earlier film yeah, noir? The, the, the 50s version, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, there's wrestling in it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But I just thought, like, the, well, as I got older, the more I got into wrestling, the more I got into the whole angle of, like, the there are these people who love this thing, and they, they put their all into it. And, like, you know, Foley was, like, lost his ear, or Edge was, like, 37, and was told, like, this thing you've loved your whole life, and you've trained forever, you could never do it again, or your neck would explode, or whatever, you know? And I, and I always found that really inspiring, and really interesting, and just, like, you know, it really makes you think, like, how far are you willing to go for the things that, that, that you love? And I thought that was, um, I mean, that's why I thought wrestling would be an interesting kind of setting for that kind of story. So, I mean, as it goes on, like, you know, we, uh... For instance, there's a writer introduced in the first issue really briefly, and then he shows up again in issue two or three. Um, we work pretty far ahead, so I'm kind of confused at which issue is what. But anyway, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, it, again, it's set around the world of wrestling, but it's not, a, like, necessarily, you know, a wrestling comic. It's not like, uh, like, like Jared Williams' Super Pro KO. Like, it all takes place, like, in the ring, and it's all crazy and whatever, you know? That's not our book. Yeah, well, when you, when you think about, you know, when you mentioned Night in the City, that made me think about just kind of no, noir in general and how that that genre very often, if if it is connected to a sport at all, is connected usually to boxing, mm -hmm. which, right. which itself is, a, is another sport that, uh, you know, the, the participants in it get kind of used until they're they're spent and then they're spit out and there's a yeah. whole kind of another realm of people who benefit from that and so on. Right. And, and you have characters in, in the first issue of ringside kind of talking about that, that right. aspect too of, of wrestling right. that they are all in this, um, you know, they're in this to make money for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And when they're done, they're not really cared for. Yeah. What a what a uplifting episode of Comics Alternative. Ringside, <laughs> <laughs> uh, November twenty fifth. No, yeah, I, I mean it's true, but also like uh, it's funny. I was talking about uh, again the same buddy I was talking about earlier. I was talking about, about the book, and he's like, "Can we just talk about something else, please?" It's so depressing. <laughs> but uh, but but I, I find that kind of inspiring too, because like, you know, uh, 
for me, I mean, look, I, I, I am, uh, I've worked in other mediums and, you know, I will in the future, but comics is the main thing I'm doing because I love doing comics. It's not like maybe I'll work on a movie or something someday. I don't fuck I don't know. Can I curse on this thing? Is that all right? Yes. All right. So I don't fucking know, you know, but, uh, it's like, you know, what are you willing to give for that thing that, that, that you love doing and whether it's, you know, uh, either job you have or a person you love or whatever. So I don't know. I just thought wrestling was a good, and also like, you know, with boxing, obviously there's a big, uh, industry behind it. Um, and obviously there's a lot of parallels. Um, I will say as someone who has just started boxing on the regular, I, uh, you know, I, um, I mean, not like competing, but you know, uh, there is like, I mean, there's sort of a theatrics to boxing, but that's not the point. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. with boxing, there's a science behind it and there's a science behind wrestling too, which is very different. But you know, with wrestling, you're telling the story and that's like kind of the major focus. You know what I mean? And also like, that's why I love, I mean, fully CM Punk and Kevin Owens. The thing that links all those guys for me and why I love them so much is they have that they're such great storytellers. And then, and, and it's amazing to watch. And that sounds like I'm being a little hoity toity pretentious and so feel free to make fun of me, but I fully, I fully stand by it. Um, whereas boxing, like, you know, you have two, two arms and, or fists and, you know, you just got to figure that out. You know what I mean? Like that's mm -hmm. just kind of it. You're not worried about the story you're telling necessarily. Um, though, although that being said, of course, there's so much, there's a lot of great writing about boxing, but anyway, that's a tangent. Um, so yeah, I thought wrestling was interesting because it also plays into like, mixing the fact and the fiction of it you know what i mean like what's real what's not you know and you know mm -hmm. of course granted there's sort of a you know wrestler or boxers rather have you know personalities that they try to sell or you know especially like the don king era where like it was really pushed kind of similar to wrestling but i don't know like i really like one of the things that really struck me when i first got the foley was this guy is such a badass and such a weird dude in the ring and then like off ring off camera he's like the nicest sweetest family man ever you know mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I thought that was interesting kind of stuff. I don't know, I feel like I've totally gone away from whatever question you were asking No, before. no, actually, I mean, you uh -huh. keyed right yeah. in on it, and, and yeah. I agree. I mean, there's something about wrestling that you don't find near as much in boxing in that, yeah. you know, there's the emphasis on character – or the right. character inflation, mm -hmm. and, and, and let's not forget costumes as well. I mean, yeah, you have a little bit of that in boxing, especially with the Don King era, but, I mean, yeah. you, know, you, you can't really beat what they do in wrestling when it comes to costumes. Oh, sure, sure. And so, and yeah. that, and that, and that's one of the reasons why I think uh, a lot of comic fans are big wrestling fans as well. Oh, sure, yeah. I don't know, Nick. What's your what's your kind of history with it? Um, well, I think you summed it up pretty well. I think the big thing with wrestling too that's interesting is that whole notion of like what's fake. You know, what is fake and what you know, <laughs> like the mm -hmm. the fact that these a lot of these guys do get so chewed up and spit out is you know, sort of it goes in contrast with how most people perceive wrestling is that it's all just sort of like a fake kind of game where no one really gets injured and, you know, it's all predetermined and that's that. But, you know, the, the real world sort of outcome of wrestling is actually quite, you know, quite huge on, on people like physically, emotionally, you know, the whole the whole work. So that, that was an interesting thing to kind of look at uh, as well. Yeah, I agree. And that's one of the things we hear from from Danny a couple of times in this first issue. Uh, like at, at one point, he's talking with oh, I can't remember the younger guy's name that we oh Reynolds Reynolds, yeah. Reynolds yeah. yeah, and he tells him you know you better have something outside outside of this because you know one this is not going to last and, and and also it's not going to be fulfilling so you need to have some kind of backup some kind of life outside of uh, the wrestling. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing with Ringside is, is, as Joe mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different perspectives within the story. So it's not just the sort of, you know, hardened um, wrestler, you know, it, there's also like the young up and coming guy and a writer and you know, there's all these different perspectives. So it's, um, that's a big part of the story. And, and we've also see another, another aspect of kind of the aftermath of the wrestling career kind of briefly with the character Andre who runs oh, the right. bail bond agency. Right. And mm -hmm. how the, the showmanship of wrestling can kind of translate, I guess, into other, other industries or other businesses. Yeah. That's great. Is that a question? I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just kind of to continue the, 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 the discussion we were having here about how, um, 
you know, already in the first issue, you have, you know, you have Reynolds, you have Danny, you have Andre, you have uh, briefly introduced to this writer, all of whom have these kind of different angles and perspectives on, right. on the wrestling. Right. And what, and what it, you know, what the future is of somebody involved in it. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like any any sort of thing, really. Uh, and that's again, that's why I really stress to people that whether or not you're into uh, wrestling, it doesn't really doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> as long as you have something in your life that you are you're passionate for, and you know, whether it's your career, or your kids, or you know, I don't know, man, craft, anything, right? Um, you know, they all have that to, to kind of relate to. And yeah, you know, there are parallels to, you know, it's not just comics, man. It's any sort of industry that, that's surrounded about art, you know. Um, you know, and how that can affect us. Someone, someone was telling me a really good story about a, a Basquiat, the artist who uh, was working under Warhol. Um, yeah, yeah. And how, like, you know, he went from basically, like, being on the street to, like, you know, he was homeless to, like, being this huge superstar. And how, like, it that really fucked him up. Um, mm-hmm. From a psychological level, like he didn't really know how to like deal with it um, at first, but like, or I mean, you know, arguably ever. But he did tell me this really great story about some guys who were like, they were in a restaurant, they were obviously talking shit, like, why is this asshole in this restaurant? You know, like they're like these like suited up Wall Street dick bags or whatever. And uh, this is totally Dan is not what you're talking about, but that was, that was interesting. Uh, and he uh, he told the waiter, he's like, I'm paying their bill, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and he pays their bill, and he was like, in that moment, like, this is fucking, this is insane. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, this is not what I came here to do. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, but this this this, in, this industry was around what he was doing, and it enabled him to, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, just li- live his life very differently than he did before. So I mean, there's that side of it, and then yeah, you know, like. Uh, 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 I guess we'll just get into it. I mean, like, uh, you know, Batman the movie comes out in 1989, and there's this massive success, and Detective Comics sells more than has ever sold. Norm Brayfogle is one of the greatest artists of all time. Yeah. yeah. Batman. And then a year ago, he's at Indiegogo to pay his medical bills. And I'm like, it's a little weird. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or uh, wrestling. You know, he had Papa Shango doing the same thing, or, you know, I don't know, whatever. It's rough, but it goes, it goes into any sort of industry, you know, whether it's comics or... Certainly, I mean, like Orson Welles' last movie was Transformers movie. Great movie, I love it. But you know, the guy <laughs> cried right to Citizen Kane. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you, you never, you never know. Well, you know, there's a lot. Of, we've been talking about a lot of the fantastic stuff that goes on in the world of wrestling, and in this first issue. And, and one of the things, Joe, that that strikes me uh, huh. that's additionally notable about Ringside is it's quite a departure from the previous work that you've been writing and, you know, just, you know, keeping the Marvel work out of the mix. I mean, uh, Mm. other things that you've done in the past few Uh years like Glory, uh, you know, Hell Yeah, and most recently Shudder, I mean, those were all fantastic in one form or another. This is much more... Real life. Uh, this, in other words, this is this is a world that we all recognize. We may not experience it, but it's something that makes sense to us. Right. Well, in issue two, Dan is getting a, a talking alarm clock, clock cat. It works, <laughs> it works so well for Shutter. Let's do it than this. No, I mean it's it's my. Th- I mean, my 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 ideal career is I want to co-create a bunch of really cool shit with a bunch of really cool people in all sorts of different formats, all sorts of different genres. I, I don't have an interest in being you know the crazy cat caught guy or whatever uh and i and you know it was very methodical that for a long time shutter was the only thing you could get for me and then i wanted my next thing to be ringside uh because it is so different and nick is a very different artist than layla and all this sort of stuff in a totally different world uh and my next thing is gonna be totally different from either one of those books and like that's i hope this is the through line i don't know if the through line is you know, see these great artists. I have no idea uh, if I, what my involvement is really. It's hard for me to tell, but yeah, I mean, it's methodical. Like, I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. You know, I, I had a great time uh, for the most part at Marvel, an okay time at DC for the most part, and uh, it was fun. But when it came to the making decision of like, I'm gonna, and again, I have nothing against those companies. I would totally work with Marvel again. Um, and uh, but you know, I was like, I almost want to do anything now, and like, and it was actually writing the first issue of Shutter where I was like. This is awesome, you know. Like you can do anything you want. 
Like, I'm just going to do this for a while. This is going to be cool. Um, and, yeah, like I said, the next thing I have, which is going to be a, a long time from now, I like to space shit out, is totally different than Shudder or Ringside in every single possible way. And that excites me. You know, I like uh, in comics you can do anything, so why the fuck would you do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, you know? We mentioned the pairing with your artists. How did uh, both of you guys meet? Nick is awesome. Is basically how that all came <laughs> out. For real, I forget. Yeah. I forget. I which catfished. I catfished it. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of true. He uh, thought I was a teenage Ukrainian girl. Not entirely. No, you were posting. I forgot who followed who, but you were posting yeah. stuff on Tumblr that was fucking awesome. Uh, I think it was the Tumblr stuff that, um, I think, yeah. I mean, I think we were following each other on Twitter anyway. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So I think it was the Tumblr stuff that got on, me on your radar. And then, we, yeah, then we just talked on Twitter and then we eventually talked on Skype. You know, used every social media um, platform we could. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then we met in person and, like, like a year later or something like that. <laughs> oh, maybe not quite that long, six months after. Uh, yeah, six, seven months. Yeah. Um, At what point did you realize he was the Ukrainian girl? Oh, I, yeah, I just, <laughs> like, right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um. But yeah, I mean, it was nothing too, like, you know, crazy. It was just like, Joe saw my art and liked it and was like, would you want to work on something? And I said, yes, I would. And then we just tried to figure out what that thing would be. So um, it wasn't like we both had this, like, oh, I've got to do a wrestling comic or nothing. Like, we're wrestling fans, but it wasn't, I think I said this before in an interview, like, it wasn't like a fan thing where... Right. You know, it was like we had to do a wrestling book or nothing. It was like we were pretty prepared to do any number of sort of different genres or, um, you know, different things. So, But that just seemed like a really interesting setting. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I uh, feel free to shut me down on this, Nick. But, you know, we're looking <laughs> forward to looking with, working with Nick in the future, too. So after ringside, like, whatever comes next, I imagine will be, like, totally different from that. I just, I don't know, I just, I just personally find that... Yeah. Neat the most exciting thing, you know, like, especially yeah. when you work with someone over and over again, like after shutter, you know, I assume when Layla and I work together again, it'd be totally different. So on and so on and so on. I don't want to like, I don't know. It's, it's exciting. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, and you were posting what I recall, like you were drawing like, like scenes from movies and maybe movie stills is even the right term. But, uh, it was like you, you drew something from Breathless from 2001. Like, even if you haven't seen those movies and you're still saying you knew it was going on, like your storytelling mm. was so good in a single image that I was like, this guy can do comics. You know, usually you need it like, I mean, and I agree, you should look at sequentials and, you know, Nick's obviously, but I just, you were so good at storytelling this single image that I was like, I know this guy can do it, you know? And then so, yeah, it was ringside. And also you were, you were actually were talking more about like, you were like, I want to do a Michael Mann comic. And I was like, Yeah. Well, I'm not Michael Mann, but I have something you might enjoy. So we both really like the movie Thief in particular. I think it was the first one we kind of bonded on. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Oh, great, great yeah. movie. Yeah. yeah, I think it is very. I think we did achieve a very kind of Michael Mann thing. Just a lot of the characters are sort of like, I get morally ambiguous, you know? Um, yeah. But uh, so yeah, that, that's that story of how we got together. Nothing, uh, nothing too crazy. But yeah, I mean, Joe took kind of a chance, I guess, because I yeah, like he said, I wasn't posting sequential stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I was working on sequential stuff, but I mean, it's tricky posting that stuff. You know, you can't really a lot of it. You can't really put up. Um, yeah. So yeah, and I'm I'm not the sort of artist that does like Spider Man samples or mm -hmm. you know, like I don't do that kind of thing. So. Yeah, he took a chance, but I mean, I've worked in animation for a long time and was a cameraman and all kinds of stuff like that, so... Oh, wait, what, like, really? Yeah, so, like, I kind of know, like, I kind of knew what I was doing. I just hadn't really done any comics. I mean, well, I had, but what's the when camera I was a lot thing? younger. Yeah. Well, so yeah I, used to do, I used to do, like, really bad um, reality TV shows and, <laughs> um, like, what we would call... I don't know what you call it in the States, but we call it, like, factual which is like when you follow around the police or like 
firefighters or something like that and film like those like cops style programs you know oh nice um, so I did a lot of that so I did like kids shows and um, I was a DOP on a kids show um, which was uh, pretty fun but yeah so not, no, no like films or anything but right well, did, did, that, did that consciously play into your, how you learned about comic storytelling or was it totally separate or yeah, well well, yeah, that's what's crazy about it. Is I wanted, I wanted nothing more than to, to draw comics. Like when I was younger, that's all I did. And like I, I would like put portfolios together, and you know, like I'd read like Wizard about like these like articles on like how to break into comics, you know. So um, I would do all the steps necessary. And um, living where I live in New Zealand, there's not really an industry. Well, there's nothing. You know, it's all self-publishing. So didn't really get me anywhere and then and then I went and did film school well university and did like film studies and that, that led into me becoming a cameraman and then I came back to comics so it was kind of like a bookend thing where comics was all I wanted to do but I'm kind of glad I did go away and learn you know more than just how to draw the Hulk smashing through a brick wall you know um yeah. so I think it, yeah I think it does pay off a lot especially with layouts like I think that it's a huge help for that sort of stuff like you know, not crossing the line and just all that type of like picking the right shots for the right beats, you know, because I see mm-hmm. in comics a lot that that's, there's all these like wacko kind of comics rules that like don't fit in with like sort of like theatrical rules, like they're at, at odds where it's that stuff like, mm-hmm. oh, whoever speaks first should be on the left, which is ridiculous because you can't, you can't constantly just be flipping back and forth across yeah. the line of like who's speaking. It's so, it'd be right. so disorientating. Um, and like the the other one is, um, you know, you should pull out at least once every page, you know, you should like the rule. I mean, it's a rule of thumb obviously, but it's like, you should see a character's feet at least like character's feet, at least one panel per page. But, you know, like if you've got an emotional scene, that's kind of ramping up the intensity. The last thing you want to do is like pull back to a big wide shot, you know, when it's like, when you're just ramping up the drama. So Yes, I'm glad I learned all that stuff. Hopefully, it pays off and ringside, and yeah. No, it's interesting to hear you say all that. A, a friend of mine, an older creator friend, was telling me about this editor he worked with back way back in the day, and the editor was like, "Oh, you can't have a character reach outside of a panel because that would never happen in a in a movie." Like. Tom Cruise doesn't reach out on the movie screen. I was like, are you a dumb piece of shit? Like, this is totally, <laughs> what, this is totally a different thing. And I was like, what is this yeah. arbitrary rule that makes zero sense, you know? I don't know, like, I think it's like anything. Like, there are a lot of stuff you read about, like, oh, this is the way things are done. It's basically guidelines of stuff that has worked for other people. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. And I think, like, you said it too when we started out. It's like, we both have, like, film interests, like, a lot yeah. of film inspiration on this and stuff but it's not you know i think you said it where it's like well we're not you know it's like we're not making a film like it is a comic Mm -hmm. like it is you know it's definitely inspired by films but you know it is a comic first and foremost so um yeah it drives me nuts when i get a stack of books and i'm like oh this motherfucker is just wanting to do a movie pitch like you're not considering how to tell this story in comics. You really are just viewing this as storyboards. i'm like get out what are you doing go just go get out of comics what are you doing? Hmm. Uh, but it's interesting to like, I mean, I don't know. Like I always think about influence. Like that being said, like you were saying, you can take influence and I do take influence for, I mean, frankly, for the most part these days, hmm. stuff outside of comics, but it's always like, how can I make this work within comics? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like exactly. I think yeah. if, if all you do is look at other comics, it's going to get really boring because you're just going to be regurgitating the same. Oh, yeah. Bullshit. That's the worst. That's the worst yeah. thing you can do. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I've talked to some people. I'm like, I'm, I'm really fascinated with what like, people are like, into outside of their work. You know what I mean? And I'm like, so what do you like besides comics? And I've had a few people be like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, are, you, are you serious? Like, I don't, you, don't like, you, know, you don't like read books or whatever? You know? Like, come on. Yeah. It's pretty boring. This is making a riveting podcast. I'm sorry. Anyway. No, it, yeah, this, like, this, like is, <laughs> this is great because Andy and I don't have to do much. Yeah, I, I went and got a sandwich. <laughs> so, <I'm> good. <laughs> Nick said it's been a while since we talked, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, actually – Keeping it on oh, top. Go ahead. No, this this back and forth leads me to another question I had is uh, the, uh, your collaboration process. Now, you know, it, you guys have a very different situation than a lot of creators do in that you're not only, you know, in different parts of uh, the same country, you know, <laughs> you're overseas. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Nick, you're in New Zealand and, uh, you know, Joe, you're in California, right? 
or is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm in Oregon. Or in so. Oregon. So yeah, you're on the West Coast. So yeah. I, uh, um, I mean, what are the logistics of the collaboration like? And then at the along with that, um, how I mean, do Joe is uh, your role strictly writing? Do you have visually based suggestions for Nick? Does Nick do much of the writing? How, how does that work? Uh, it's interesting though, because you say like, oh, you know, Nick, you live so far away, it's crazy. But I'm like, Layla has a studio like two blocks away from my studio, my work studio. I hate calling it that, my office, whatever. Anyway, uh, and I don't know, I probably see her as much as I see Nick. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, maybe a little bit more, but like, or at least, no, that's not true. But like more like, you know, we probably talk as much is what I mean. And it doesn't mean like we don't talk at all. We actually talk a lot, you know, um, or email a lot. The only time I ever remember it coming into conflict was we were putting this walking this teaser for the back of Walking Dead 147, and there was like all these questions and all this not drama about it, but just like a lot of things we had to figure out. And then like it's like me, the colorist, and the letter, and then Nick like we figured it out, it was fine. And Nick comes in, he's like, "Oh hey, I slipped through all this. Like <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks guys." And I was like, "You son of a bitch." Yeah. But, well, I, I mean, it's 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 exacerbated by the fact that I am in a different time zone, but also I'm a comic book artist, so like. You know, yeah. my hours are ridiculous anyway, so that <laughs> adds to kind of the problem. But um, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it seems we're working fine. Like you know, oh, it's totally fine. Yeah, yeah, it's um, I mean, I think it works well with you, Joe, because when you write scripts, it's pretty open to like, like if I want to change stuff or well, not change stuff, but like, you know, if you say like, you know, it's a shot of this, it's a shot of that, and and I, and I sort of think of something else, you're pretty open to that. Whereas yeah. If you were like a real stickler for like, no, you have to draw every line that's in the script, then maybe us being, you know, having a time zone between us would probably be an issue because well, sometimes those, it can they, be like 24 hours before, you know, an email gets received really. or something like that, you know. Well, people who think that way should just start writing novels. I, this shit drives me nuts. <laughs> well, no I can't think of anything worse, yeah. Um, but I mean, it's just like, you know what? You're not the artist. Like uh, my scripts are, yeah. I, I work full script. Uh, you know, I usually, I come up with the stories myself at first and then, you know, we, we, I always send it and like, we always talk about it, whatever, you know? Um, mm -hmm. the reason I love comics so much is I do love that collaboration, man. I love the fact that, yeah. you know, you have your voice, I have mine, uh, Simon has his, Ariana has hers and like these four things come together to create this whole that would not exist without, you know, whatever. Uh, so I don't yeah. know. I, it, to me, it's like, that's one of the big reasons I love comics and it's not like stuff has changed so much. I, re I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, maybe like add a panel or maybe change up. I don't remember. It's mostly visual shit. The narrative is already all there. The narrative remains the same, you know, like yeah. the, as long as the dial, I mean, like I always look at it like Kelly Cedar comic put it really well, which is not pretty deadly, which by the way is amazing comic. Mm -hmm. She was like, I have the last word on words and Emma Rios has the last word on pictures. And I was like, yeah. that is totally my approach. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Like so I have I, last words, and Nick has the last word on pictures. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, like when I was thinking of like, well, you know, can I can I draw comics for a living? Like, do I do I have what it takes? I used to like, you know, grab scripts off comic scripts off the internet and like have read through them and sort of you know like thumbnail it out or whatever just to see like if I could do it. And some of them were just so complex in terms of like the writing. It wasn't really writing; it was more di like camera direction, you know, and mm -hmm. that stuff. It just trips you up when you're trying to tell your own like trying to interpret this the script into visuals when it's you know tons and tons and tons of camera info that you don't necessarily need you just need the story beats and the acting and the dialogue like you know descriptions of what's happening and how people feel about it you don't need um you know every sort of you know angle like like looking up through the railing we see this kind of thing like because you know the artist should just be able to draw that beat however they feel necessary and yeah so that's take note uh potential comics writers just don't bother writing that stuff if you've got a good artist because well, uh, it's, yeah. it's just gonna well, slow you down well sometimes i like to do it for myself and i think the thing i think mm. i told you when we first started working together was like you have a better idea that's fine like in terms of like again not in terms of narrative or whatever but in terms of other oh, yeah. yeah like um yeah i mean and like you know actually i don't know if you know this but one part of my God, my process, whatever, uh, that I do is I actually, I draw layouts for myself and I, I never show them yeah. to anybody, but I just do it more so like, 
you know, because yeah. you use the comic as unit, and I try to like make sure, like, okay, this is on the left hand page, this is on the right hand page, and like exactly, this yeah. work. And like with Shutter, yeah. there's there's sometimes more of a math to it because it's like, um, you know, we do kind of crazy layouts and shit like that. So I'm like, okay, how does this even work? Like, there was a yeah. issue of Shutter where I wanted to um, kind of do like one of those tra- trail style comics, like they kind of something do like stuff like Family Circus or whatever, where you like follow the path and you see what happens. And so I, and Layla was like, I don't fucking read Family Circus. What are you talking about? So I was like, well, okay, make it look like this. So I drew like a thing that was my, my version of it. And I sent it to her and she was like, oh, okay, I can make this actually awesome. You know what I mean? But again, like yeah. it's, it's, it's collaboration, you know, like yeah, I get exactly. so fucking bored when I read like, you know, that's one of the reasons I fucking got off Twitter. But anyway, like, oh, uh, what's uh, more important, writers or artists? I'm like, shut the fuck up. If you're doing comics wrong, yeah. then you start noticing that shit. If you do it right. It's all collaboration. Everyone is important. John yeah, Wood, it's, it's Ariana, weird, yeah. If you need, or like, excuse me, Ariana on ringside, like, the, the letterers, they're amazing. John Workman is, like, uh, I, mm-hmm. I write sound effects knowing that he's going to draw them. You know what I mean? Like, ugh. Ah, uh, shit, trust me, bananas. Anyway, sorry, Nick, I interrupted yeah. you. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I use the analogy, you know, because, like, there's a big issue these days with not crediting people in creative teams on comics and you know i used the analogy to someone recently which in my head was the best one which was just it's like a band you know like you can't yep like a a band gets together and creates the sound you can't create that sound with just one or two of those people you know hammering away on the instruments you need everybody contributing for the overall thing so to not like so say to talk about a band in an article or something and not mention and just talk about sort of one of the members would be, I guess that happens a little bit with lead singers and things like that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's the thing, like you're saying with collaborating, you know, it's like, that's, that's ideally like the colorist, letterer, writer, artist, everybody, editor, yeah. everyone like pulls their weight and you get like an end product from it. You know, right. you can't, you can't get that thing without all those people. Yeah. A thousand percent agree. To, to steer back to something you were talking about earlier with uh, the kind of cinematic influences that you have and the um, and the difference between film and comics, one of the pages that I was really struck by that uh, y- you did here, Nick, was uh, I don't have the page numbers because I have a digital copy, but it's it's when um, Danny and Amy are sitting around the fire uh, and they're talking and and. Danny's kind of explaining to Amy what's going on, why why he's re- returned, uh, and so you have a kind of narrow column of just medium shot, medium close ups of each of the uh, each of these two characters, and then next to them is a flashback to Danny getting the phone call from Teddy. Yeah, and so that layout, that you know, flashbacks and things like that, those are all kind of you know, cinematic concepts, but yet that layout couldn't, couldn't be done. Something like that could, there's no equivalent for that in a film. Yeah. And yet, yet those flashbacks also, you're using a kind what looks to me like a kind of wide angle lens. Yeah. Look, because the, um, yeah, it does look distorted. The edges are curved in around that. So, so there's this interesting combination of, of the cinematic and the comic that you're really working into. Uh, yeah. This book that's I mean, really interesting. It's gonna sound like uh, I, I get a bit like Joe, where like it sounds kind of like pretentious for me to like, I guess you know, discuss it too in depth. But yeah, that <laughs> page was was kind of like, I mean, the idea is obviously you have a pretty with the colors, you have a pretty obvious shift between like what's the present day and what's the flashback. Yeah. But also, I mean, to shoot like camera wise, like to shoot close ups like that of two people talking, you'd be on a really long lens, and so. Mm-hmm. The flashbacks are on a really wide lens, so it's essentially a complete opposite lens. Um, yeah, so it's just like another way to differentiate the two different scenes, really. Um, but plus, I, I just really like drawing like fisheye kind of stuff where <laughs> possible. It's not always possible, <laughs> as I learned pretty quickly. Like sometimes I just try to shoehorn it in, but it is best used sparingly. Um, but I, yeah, I really like it. It's yeah, super easy it. to do with um, digital as well. How's that like? What difference is it like? I don't know anything about drawing digitally. So what? What? what, what oh, what I difference? mean, because because with digital, what you can do is you can draw it like with the correct perspective, and then you can just transform, use like a mesh transform, which basically gives you like a grid over the image where you can drag 
kind of like like reshape the image so you can oh. just do what a lens does where you can just push out the edges to it's completely curved oh that's dope um, yeah and you got it's a little bit of trial and error it doesn't work perfectly but um yeah it's uh it's pretty fun it's fun to play around with that stuff that is red yeah so in terms of the the way that we're seeing these characters in this first issue, and I guess you know first and foremost there's there's Danny Nosos, um, is his look the result of basically you know Joe you giving Nick like you know a bare outline of how you see the character, and then Nick going to it? Yeah, I mean I, I, I wouldn't say bare. You know what I mean? Like I think especially like the lead characters, whether it's Danny on this or. Kate on ringside or whoever on the next thing or whatever. Uh, I think I'm pretty thorough. I mean, I, I like, and I don't know if it's annoying to artists. I know Layla really likes it, but I, sometimes I talk more about like, like what they are. Oh God, you're right, Nick. This comes off as fucking pretentious. <laughs> but, but, but it, like, you know, it I'm comes not off... saying it is pretentious. I'm no, just like, you know, I just want to interrupt for a second. This is a podcast where we just bill ourselves as two guys <laughs> with PhDs, so we're already pretentious. That's right. So feel free. <laughs> Whoa, if you want a community <laughs> college dropout, I don't know what Nick's fucking background is. You are, you are ready to go. Um, but anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Like, talk about the more emotional side of shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, like who they are and what they're into and, like, what kind of stuff they've seen. Like, with Danny and Kate, I mean, I kind of always do this. Like, I built, like, a timeline for them, which I think I sent to Nick at one point. Yeah. But I think yeah, we've really been working on the book for a while when you already had that. But anyway, like, I like that kind of stuff more. And I'll say, like, oh, you know, like this or that or whatever. Da, da, da. But again, like, uh, Nick's my collaborator, man. We're partners on this thing. Like, you know, stuff gets changed, yeah. stuff, whatever. It goes both ways, though, you know? Yeah, I never really thought about the fact that you do explain the characters on a more, like, you know, emotional level. Because um, someone asked me about how I design characters, like, in an interview. And, like, I don't design the characters. I just... Uh, I just read the script, and it's like when you read a novel, you picture what a character looks like in your head, and yeah. with Joe's script, I usually know fairly quickly what a character, what I, you know, how I think the character would look, and then I'll just basically draw them in the layouts, and if I don't know how they look prior to starting the layouts, you know, they take shape as I draw those, but yeah, that's the thing, is the way he explains the characters, it's quite easy to picture them, it's not a physical description of how they look, it's kind of yeah it's more like who they are now this first issue is an oversized issue and i'm wondering um you know there there are a number of creators not everyone at image but there are a number of image titles where the number one issue begins as oversized and i know a lot of readers feel that they're getting more bang for the buck uh, was that uh, was that something that both of you had in mind from the beginning that you did want to you know start everything going with this oversized issue uh yeah cuz uh, there's a couple things come into it one is like you know, I was saying earlier when I was doing the first issue of Shutter and having the you know the understanding of like, oh shit, we can do whatever we want. Like that's that's fucking badass. Uh, it was like, well, why not do an oversized first thing? Like I, I, well, on Shutter was just I started writing on the left hand page. Like when you open a Shutter, there's no ad on the inside front cover. It's all like um, it's all uh, comics right away. And I my thinking on that, like I saw Eric Stevenson doing it on Nowhere Men, and then me and a uh, uh, my buddy uh, Brandon was a dude. We, I was in Glory. He was doing Profit at the time. We were talking about that and how much. I mean, my thing was, was like, oh man, it's fucking awesome because, like, when you read Sandman number one, there's a fucking ad for combos and like, look, I love combos. <laughs> They're delicious. <laughs> but it's also like, well, like it's supposed to be like this. Oh, elegant. Oh, it's Sandman. He's an emotional journey in the dreamscape and it's like oh buy pizza roll combos you know it's like, <laughs> what the fuck is this um so i was like all right my image stuff we can do whatever we want we starting the left hand so with shadow number one it was my first book coming back from doing some marvel dc stuff which again marvel dc fine um but since i could do whatever i think i was so overwhelmed with it that the first couple issues of shutter i think read kind of janky because it's like oh it's crazy i'm too excited uh. Um, so on, on ringside, I was like, well, why don't we just like ease into the world some more, take our time, let people like settle down and shit like that. And, um, and when I outlined it, I was like, well, instead of trunking 20 pages, we can just do a, an oversized first issue. 
Um, and we're also, I mean, whatever, it's not announced yet, but who cares? The fifth issue is also, which is the last issue of the arc, is also oversized. Um, but, it you is. know, it's like, I don't know, like, what? It is? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. You're learning new things as well, Oh, actually, Nick. I did know that. No, no, no sorry, did I didn't know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I yeah, sent the script sorry. and well, I'm sending the, the next part. Yeah, you get two different chunks. Uh, but, uh, well, I, know, I was thinking, I was reading um, one of my favorite comics right now, which, Nick, if you don't read this, you, of all people, would love it. The Fade Out. Have you read that? Yeah. I read The Fade Out. Oh, oh man. Yeah. So badass. Um, That's great. But anyway, I was, I was reading the back. Uh, I love like, when Brew Baker and Phillips talk about stuff in the back of the book. And Brew Baker was talking about, he's like, you know, he's comparing it to like a serialized novel, which I guess suppose is kind of similar for um, Ringside in a sense, because it does have an ending, but everything I do kind of has an ending. But anyway, um, he was talking about, it's like sometimes the chapters are 20 pages long, sometimes they're 28, you know? And like, again, it was just like really settling in of like the, having the freedom to do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, like, I mean, I like I read a lot of Japanese comics, and like you know, they have obviously just so much kind of real estate to to introduce things. Like, I started reading Billy Bat that Urasawa comic, and like the whole oh, first shit. volume, the whole first volume or chapter, I guess it is, is like his comic within the comic, and it doesn't allude to anything more than that. That's what the comic is. Oh, sweet. And, you know, and like, that's pretty ballsy. Like, if you put a comic out in the States that, um, you know, the whole first issue didn't suggest what the whole series was going to be about, I think people would be quite, you know, taken aback. And another one was, um, I read this book, I Am I Am a Hero, which is like a kind of like a Walking Dead, Japanese kind of Walking Dead. Comic, I think I think Dark Horse are putting it out next year or something like that in English. Oh, nice. But oh yeah, it's uh, it's, it's really good. But the first volume wasn't very good. <laughs> like the first volume was okay. Like the dialogue was pretty awful and stuff like that. Um, but but I mean it was a whole volume, so two hundred and something pages where not much happened until like the last sort of ten pages, and then volume two was great, and it was like. I almost didn't stick it out until the second volume because I didn't really like the first volume, but like US comics, it's very much like, like, f you know, pedal to the floor. Like you have to introduce everybody, set everything up very, very, very quick. So I think having an oversized first, is first issue is quite important to do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, Cerebus? oh, sorry. Cerebus. Yeah. No, no. I always want. I always wanted to, but it just. Even when I was young, there was just so much of it. I was like, yeah. oh, at some point, I'll sit down and. Yeah, the length of the project, uh, you know, can be debilitating. Yeah, but the thing about I mentioned about service is, uh, you know, I love it until it goes completely fucking off the rails. But yeah. the first book's not very good. It's like a huge. It's like twenty four issues in there, and most of it is just like his dumb. It's just fine. It's fun, but it's like this dumb Conan parody. Yeah, and again, again, it's super fun. And then, like, and the first time I read Cerebus, I was like, oh, kind of waiting through it, which I have a friend of mine who, who really gets irritated when I say this. But but then, like, towards the end of the first arc or the first book, which, again, they're huge-ass trays. Again, 20-something issues. And it's like, oh, this gets interesting. And then volume two is brilliant. Right. So, like, and, and actually, it's something I really, I don't know, again, huge tangent, but let's go. Uh, I really find sad about comics these days. It's like, could you imagine a book coming out these days that doesn't really pick up until issue 24? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, most, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, mo and well, then it goes on for 20 more years. But anyway, it's like... They can't even get to issue 9. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also like, it's not so much a sales thing. Well, I mean, it is, but like, I, like, I think there's a a reader... Um, uh, how do I put it? Like... Uh, patience thing, I guess. I don't know. I don't think I'm wording that right. But like, for instance, in in Shudder, we introduce who the main antagonist are in issue 12, and we had a very nice write up. It was, I mean, I really appreciate it. It was really nice. She was really kind in the series on Bleeding Cool by Hannah Mean Shannon, where she was like, "Oh man, so bold, they're doing this." And I'm like, "It's issue 12." You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I, I, maybe it's weird, but I just, I just thought it was just like, I don't know, such a. And it was like the first time I really thought about how much it's changed in comics now in terms of like the expectation 
or maybe it hasn't changed and maybe just Cerebus was a weird anomaly. I don't know. But like, gosh, like again, like we were talking earlier about this review we got for number one that was like, oh, here's exactly what ringside is. And I'm like, A, you have not read a single page that goes beyond this, so you don't know what the hell you're talking about. B, uh, really? Like, you're judging? Like, I mean, whatever. Maybe it's because there's so much more stuff out now. I don't fucking know. But it, it, it is, it, I don't know, I think I've been thinking about that a lot lately in terms of, like, how that's changed and how story, and how you can, like, buck against that. I don't mm-hmm. know. Like, um, uh, I really like, I really like Marvel books a lot. Like, the Secret Wars is the shit. I, I haven't read the, the spinoffs, but I love the main series by Ribbick and Hickman. Um, and what was I was reading something new. It was a Stalker Strange, but it was uh, B- 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 Bacala, Bacala. And uh, Jason Aaron is fucking dope. Like, it's so good. Uh, mm-hmm. And the visuals are amazing. But, like, I think it's weird Shudder has more issues out than Amazing Spider-Man right now. Do you know what I mean? Like... Maybe that's me coming from an earlier era as a reader and finding it strange, but I don't, I don't know. This are, is a are weird thing. It's time, are you saying it's time to relaunch Shudder? No, I think we should relaunch Ringside. We've, done, we've got one issue out. Shudder. <laughs> all new, all different. Actually, man, that's... Well, you, see, can do, you can do what Marvel does and see, you know, like, for 2013, how many number one issues of Ringside you can come out within a 12-month period. Yeah. I don't know, whatever. I mean, again, it's not a knock on them. I just think it's like, mm-hmm. it, my, my point is not to knock anybody. My point is to like how much that's changed and that what the effect mm-hmm. is. And again, it's like, I'm not being nostalgic because of issue numbers because who cares, but the effect that now has on storytelling and what readers' mm-hmm. expectations, that's what readers' expectations are on storytelling, you know? We're like, get everything out now, you know? Which again, maybe for the better. I don't know, but it is interesting again because I keep thinking about Cerebus and how it took forever to get going. Yeah. And then, I, I think I think about that with Love and Rockets too, oh, especially yeah. especially oh, yeah. Jaime's yeah. stuff because it starts out as a science fiction series with these characters, yeah. and then there's like a two page story where Maggie is reading the Mechanics comic on the on the bus, and she just goes, Pfft. and then that's that's it. That that world doesn't exist in that comic anymore. I love shit except like in slight references. Yes, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. I love stuff like that so much. Oh, Hernandez brother is so good. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> no, I do, you know, so, so to answer the question, it was necessary to do an oversized <laughs> first issue. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for bringing it back, Nick. I, uh, you're welcome. Because right before you said that, I was about to go off on a tangent about the proliferation of number one. So I'll, I'll just uh, no, resist that temptation. No, I mean, I love- that, that that is a pet peeve of mine. And I do think that... You know, and I'm not saying this is just a publisher issue. I think it's a reader issue as well because there's a whole psychology that goes on there. And I, I don't know if that's you know very productive at all for the medium. But again, that's 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 another topic. Mm. But the oversized issue too. I mean, it gives Nick. It gives you the chance to do those those two really amazing uh, two page spreads. You know, the one at the beginning where we're introduced to the the ring. Uh, and and the the one the kind of one moment of wrestling in the in the comic, and then yeah. and then towards the end when we get this this twist about um, about Danny and Amy. Yeah, yeah. I mean that was the good thing too. Is like being my first professional comic, um, having thirty two pages to draw was definitely better than having twenty to draw. You know, like it was it was almost like an issue and a half to kind of figure out the style and how the characters look and all that, all that sort of stuff. Now, especially as it comes down to the, the art, uh, do you guys plan to do what I know a lot of creators at, at image have been doing over the past couple of years. And that is have the first arc, then that have there be like a two or three month period of respite or priming the pump. And then you come back with the next. In other words, you have these kind of built in pauses to where, it's kind of a safeguard that the work gets out there, it gets done, and you guys can recharge your batteries. Yeah, well, yeah, we're totally doing that. I think it's a great model. I mean, we, we've been doing it on Shutter. We're totally doing that on Ringside. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. Like, we we're not stopping, but mm-hmm. like, like that's that's the, that's the thing that people don't I think, realize. Like, it's not like we're like, all right, let's all go to Hawaii for a month. Like, no, we're really, we're <laughs> still working, you know. But it just enables. Again, uh, Ringside, it's a, it's a collaboration with Nick Barber. I don't want anyone else drawing Ringside. I've got a couple of books coming up where it's built in to have, like, guest artists 
because I like the idea of it, you know, but just on sometimes whatever. Uh, so it's like, I don't want anyone to draw on this book. And truth matter is Nick is so fast. We probably could just go monthly, but yeah. I, I also think like, so I also work, like I said, I also work in retail, uh, with a store and I think it, it does help us, especially on, um, you know, look ringside, two newer guys making it, um, new concept and enables me to have better metrics to order as it goes on because like the name of the game anyone can sell issue one who cares how can you sell issue nine that's the trick and mm -hmm. so it comes down yeah. to both as creator and, and as retailer so with those breaks when ringside five comes out i'll be doing my foc for ringside volume one and then by the time i have the foc for ringside number six because we're doing five issue args I will have the metrics for both the sell through on ring sides one through five, and I'll have the metrics for the sell through on the volume one. So let's say ring side doesn't do great as single issues. If my trades go up, I'll be able to enable me to order more of number six. So it works out great. Like and it's, it's the way to do it. Anyone who's not doing it, I, I encourage you to do it. Um, it's better for your creative team. It's better for your economics. It's better all, all around. Yeah. I, um, I've talked to people, uh, obviously, you know, the, big one like sagas on hiatus at the moment and everyone i've talked to about that has been like really excited like no one's been like oh man you know I'm not gonna get my issues everyone's like oh great i can catch up or like people yeah. are sort of like even just jumping onto the book from the beginning and yep. it's like when you know a tv show ends and then you wait you know game of thrones ends and you wait like a year for more episodes mm -hmm. um yep. because they have to make more episodes um yeah, I mean, ours won't be that extreme. It'll just be like the usual, like probably a break when the trade, you know, hits or something like that. But um, yeah, I wouldn't be if you're if you're uh, excited to read Ringside. I can't imagine there's going to be too much downtime um, in between the arcs. Yeah, at least one month for the trade, maybe another month yeah. off. I don't know just yet. I mean, yeah, it'd be nothing too drastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely not between the issues. I yeah yeah yeah. Imagine. yeah. Yeah. No, 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 never, 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 never during an arc. <laughs> Whatever, yeah, not yeah. fuck it up, we'll be fine, you know. But yeah, 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 we're we're already quite far ahead. Yeah, we're we're good. Well, I don't want you to give anything away, but do you guys already have kind of a general sense of about how far you'll want to take this story? I mean, you know, Joe, earlier you mentioned something about an endpoint. Uh, is there a sense of how many issues this will be ultimately? Yeah, but I'm keeping that to myself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. 100. Yep. 100 <laughs> issues. Hey, you mentioned Cerebus. Why don't you uh, use that as a, as a, as a target yeah, goal? I was talking to someone. This is another fucking self-indulgent topic but uh, or tangent. But like I was talking to someone this week. I don't know that I have that in me, the book that like goes on forever. I don't know. I like I like new things. I like um, you know stories ending. I'm a big fan of that, which sounds ridiculous, but yeah. it's true. Like I like... I like knowing that ringside is going to be going somewhere and then we'll end. And I like knowing that, I don't know, like as a reader, fade out. Like I'm a super bummed it's ending, but I'm also like not. I'm also excited that, you know, that it, it's like, I, well, from the get-go, they're like, it's going to be a finite thing, whatever. And it's exciting to me because I'm like, oh, I know it's going somewhere or whatever. And whether it's, you know, 12 issues or 60 issues or whatever, like I like to have some sort of idea of where it's going. You know, that being said, ringside's not – Super short. I mean, it'll, it'll be going on for a bit. Um, I, I do get driven insane when people are like, oh, I've got an ongoing series, and it's eight issues long, or seven issues long, or five issues long. And I was like, dude, you're a mini. Calm down. Um, yeah. But anyway. You definitely got to end things on a high note. I mean, yeah. um, it's no sense. Like, if the story's been told, there's no sense dragging it on. Well, ever. I mean, that, that was a thing on Glory. Like, uh, uh, we, like I initially was like, oh, I want to go like 70 issues. I had this crazy idea. And then I got to issue 25, and I was like, oh, this is 12 issues long at max. And both Eric and Rob, in fact, I just saw Rob last week, and he was like, if you guys want to keep going, we would let you keep going. And I was like, yeah, I know, but we we're done. Like, it, you just don't want a, a character, well, something happens at the end of the second to last issue, and then the second to last issue, to, and like, if you go beyond the, what, you know, the, the ramifications of that, you're just dragging your feet. So the 13th issue of Glory would have just been like, well, we're here. You know what I mean? Like, what's going on? And, you know, to this day, we get, Sophie and I both get asked to do more Glory, and I'd rather have that than people being like, oh, Sophie and Keating were going on for a million yeah. years, and that started to suck. Like, it was great for 12 issues, and it started to suck after that, you know? I'd rather, like, yeah. tell your story, you know, tell your story and then get out, you know? 
And again, yeah. it could be it could be twelve issues, it could be fifteen issues, it could be twenty five issues, it could be sixty issues, whatever. As long as it's true to your story and your characters, you're fine. Like Saga, I get the impression it's going to go on for a very long time. But you know what? They announced it's the life story of this girl, and I'm really stoked to see her life unfold. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. Walking Dead. I'm such a huge fan of that, and it's awesome. And like, I love the fact that like it started off as like this zombie survival thing, and now they're like making bread and have like windmills and shit. You know, <laughs> like, I lo- I lo- I'm serious. I love that stuff, but it works for Walking Dead. You know, exactly. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah. They, you know, what works for Walking Dead is not going to work for Ringside. It's not going to work for Shutter. It's not going to work for the Fade Out. Whatever. You know. Yeah. If you your characters and story, then you're fine. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. So exactly. it will end. It will end when it is time for it to end. Yep. So, hundred issues. Hundred issues. <laughs> or bust. You know, someone's gonna now report that oh, Keating and the Barber said a hundred issues, and it's like, oh god. Wait, yeah. Barber and Keating tell Otley and uh, Kirkman to watch out. <laughs> <laughs> and we can make that a comics alternative exclusive. Hundred, <laughs> two hundred episodes. Um, they got a bit of a head start though with Invincible and the Walking, and you know he's got Walking Dead, so a little bit of a head start. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, an example I was going to use was like one of my favorite comics is 20th Century Boys, and like that's oh, a comic you. where like that should have ended like a few volumes before it did end, and I feel like it was supposed to, but obviously with I feel I mean I could be wrong, it's all just me making assumptions, but it seems like the publishers were like, no, no, let's keep this thing going, and yeah, the last few volumes are just very unnecessary. There's a very clear point where it ends and it's over. Um, can we, can so, we have Urasawa yeah. Book Club for a second? Because I, I don't know. I just I, I I fucking agree with you a thousand percent. I think the ending ending of Twenty First Century Boys, like where end end ends. You know what I'm talking about? Like I think that's good. But it's so yeah. weird because they kill that character and then yeah, that's what I mean. Like, that's the ending. Yeah, that's the ending, and then it's like it just keeps going. But then it's like it tells the same. It's the, the last Nefri volumes are almost exactly the same as the previous yeah. three. Like beat yeah, to for me beat. It, to me, it feels like publisher pressure because that was a serialized right. comic. So you know, like there are quite a lot of examples of that um, creators over there, you know, working against their will on a project that's done. But uh, which is also my fear on Billy Bat because that's still going. Um, but I mean, that is a. Billy Bat's a series that could go forever, you know, like mm. at the scope of it. But yeah, yeah, I haven't read it yet because I, I, I think the editions of are doing are so good that I'm yeah. kind of like I'm just waiting for it to come out through them. It's it's the best one. Yeah. Uh, just gonna put that out there. Well, although I'm only like halfway through up, like to what's up, just come out. But yeah, it's blown me away. It's like a, his whole take on like Disney and like. 20th century United States, like Coca-Cola and Disneyland and civil rights movement. And just, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it's like a huge story. Right. Um, yeah. Cause Billy bad is essentially Mickey mouse. Um, right. It's, yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. That's something I want to check out. It's yeah. really, really good. I advise everybody to check it out. <laughs> nice. I, uh, I haven't checked out Billy bad, but Naki is one of my favorite guys working today. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, I love yeah, I love monster. Too, yeah. yeah. Well, Nick and Joe, I want to thank you guys for being on the Comics Alternative and talking with us about issue number one of Ringside and other matters as well. Anytime, yeah. it's been a pleasure. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Great, great first issue. Everybody, listen, oh. go out and get it. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, good luck with the success. All right, thanks. Good. Thanks for having us. Well, that that conversation uh, went in a lot of different directions, but it was it was fun. Uh, it was fun to listen to those guys talk about not only Ringside about but about other aspects of the industry and the comics they're into. Oh, exactly. And in fact, once we got into the conversation, it's almost as if we got things started. Like we're winding up toys. <laughs> let, let them go at it. Yeah, that was fun. I uh, had a good time listening to those guys, and we want to thank Nick and Joe again for taking the time and being on the podcast, especially for Nick, who's out there in New Zealand. It was early in the morning for him. Yep. 
Uh, so if you want to find good comics like Ringside uh, and pre-order them, then you have to visit the website of our sponsor, and that is Discount Comic Book Service. That's dcbservice.com. But you can also help out the comics alternative by getting your stuff that you would normally get on Amazon.com through our website. If you go to comicsalternative.com slash Amazon, then uh, you'll see a link that will take you right to Amazon.com. So you can get, let's say, more of Joe Keating's books. Uh, you can order other graphic novels. You can, you can order food. You can order – it doesn't really matter. Whatever you get through that click-through through Amazon.com, Andy and I get a couple of cents here or there in kickback. And, and you can't go wrong with that. So take, We like the kickback. We like the kickback. Skim a little from Bezos and give the comics <laughs> alternative. Yep. And after you do get your comics, either at DCB Service or your material through Amazon, get in touch with us and let us know the kind of things that you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you will see a link where you can send us a recorded message through the wonders of SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right. Or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us by Twitter, where we ha- where on our Twitter feed, we announce new content to the podcast as well as updates to the blog. You can check out our Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right, but we don't stop there when it comes to social media because you can find us on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Instagram, on Google+, on Pinterest, and on YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, and you can find every single one of our episodes as well as our reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's at the website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. Yeah, and we do like to hear from you. So until next time, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.